Uh, I want to look at uh, Psalm uh, 126. I think I said to you last time that this summer, as, as I preach uh, uh, once a month or so, that I want to look at a couple of the, psalm, the Psalms of Ascent. And, uh, and so we're going to look at Psalm 126 that deals with joy and sorrow. And uh, let's, let's open God's Word now and, and uh, hear what He has to say. You can follow on the screens. You can open up in your smartphone, your Bible, or you can just listen. Starting at verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Let's pray. Father God, as we, as we look into your living word today, we invite you to speak. Take away the distractions, take away the discouragements, take away uh, the things of this past week and the things that could distract us that we're thinking about that are to come. And help us to hear from you. We know that it's only through your spirit that we can hear with spiritual ears and that we can see with spiritual eyes. And Father, whether we're here today, uh, some of us here today are are people that are filled with doubts, uh, maybe discouraged. Some of us um, are not even sure what we believe about you. If that's where we come from today, Father, um, I pray that you would speak to us. And for those, Father, that perhaps uh, are filled with faith at this, um, in this season of life, and, and we would say that we're Christians. Speak to us. Encourage us. Help us to understand more of what it means to be your follower. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every summer, uh, Teresa's family, her, her mom and dad, will take the family on a family vacation. I don't know if any of your families do that, but for our family, that means uh, quite often that 19 people will all cram into a house somewhere, uh, somewhere in the, in the country. And, and so we've went to Outer Banks, we've went up to uh, Niagara and uh, Lake Ontario, we've been uh, to Jersey Shore. But this one particular year, a few years ago, we went uh, to the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. And uh, during our time there, uh, with I think it was 19 of us that year, we, uh, we went to Dolly World. Uh, we saw where Dolly Parton was born. Uh, we went on some cool rides at Dolly World. We, we went to um, a, a bunch of uh, bluegrass um, plays, okay? I'm not a big bluegrass person, but it was kind of fun. And, uh, and my father-in-law, I think, he, he loves bluegrass music. And, and, you know, and they sang songs like, Build Me a Cabin in, in the Corner of Glory Land. Okay, I, I like learned and heard all these new songs. And it, 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 was, a, it was a hoot. Uh, but the, the thing that I probably enjoyed the most on this particular trip was when we, we all went uh, rappelling together. And uh, you, you, it started out on a platform, and it was, it was in the mountains. Okay, so we started on a platform. You get all rigged up, and then you jump. My wife was terrified. She doesn't like heights, but she did it. Everybody did it. And you jump from the tree, and you just kind of go zipping along, and you land at another tree. And by the time you get to the second tree, you've went from being at the ground level, okay, to now being about 50 feet in the air. And then, and then you hook in, and you get on the next zip line, and you go again. And we went from tree to tree. Well, at one point, as you, you get to this tree, and you're about 100 feet up in a tree, they clip you in, and you look ahead of you, and it's just a sheer drop down into the valley. And, it's a, and, you, and you can't see... Uh, where the tree is that you're going to be going to next. You just see the zip line going through the sky and it just kind of disappears. It was over a quarter mile zip line. And so as, as you jump from that tree and you go, you're, you're, you're over 100 feet above, like a, a couple hundred feet some of the time, above the forest tree line below you. And, you, and you're, just, you're just out there by yourself, alone, just gliding through the sky. And you just have to think, you know what, yeah, if the line breaks, I know I'll be in glory land. I'll be with Jesus very quickly. But you don't think about those things. You just go for it. That was my favorite experience. Uh, you, but, you know, the, the other thing about this trip was the drive down. And that was an eventful 
experience as well, but it was a little bit different because it's a, an 11 hour drive, okay, down to, to uh, where we stayed in the Smoky Mountains. And as, as we drove down, Teresa and I decided that we would, we would stop somewhere along the way and, and, and stay overnight at a hotel. And I just said, don't, you know, we'll just book it on the way down. We'll see when we get tired. Anybody ever done that before? We'll just book a hotel on the way down. But the problem was there was a huge storm that had went through Virginia. It had knocked out all the power on, on, the, on the east side of Virginia into the west. And so every hotel room um, within several states was taken up because people were staying in them that had lost their power. And so, uh, tr- no kidding, Teresa made like 75 calls as we're driving down the highway. And I, we're anticipating, oh yeah, we'll just stop here. And we couldn't find anything. Everything was closed until one person answered the phone and told us they had one room and it was pretty close to the Tennessee line. It's like 2.30 in the morning by this point, okay? And we're exhausted and we pull into this place and I'm telling you, I felt like I was in a Stephen King movie, okay? It was scary. When I, and she, you know, Teresa and the kids stayed in the car. I went inside, talked to the person at the counter and I, I walked out and I was like, well, we'll, we'll be fine with my voice quivering, you know? And, and uh, I mean, it was, it was dingy, it was dark, it was dismal, it was a scary place. When we went into the room, okay, the, there, were, there were the stains on the, on, the, on, the, on the comforter, on the bed of where the last person had, you know, just evidence that somebody had been there before us. And Teresa was like, I am not sleeping in this place. And my kids are like, why would you do this to me? Do you not love me? And, and, and so I'm like, we'll be okay, we'll be okay. If you want to sleep in the car, you can sleep in the car. But, you know, we had a couple of uh, picnic blankets. We put them over top of the bed, and, and we slept. I, I, I slept with one eye open, um, wishing that I had packed heat, you know. And I don't even own a gun, but it was a scary place. <laughs> All that aside, every year when we do these vacations, a lot of great memories on these vacations. Um, But one thing that happens every year on these trips with Teresa's family, it's typically on the last night. We'll sit down together, and uh, her mom and dad will say, okay, share one to two prayer requests that you have. One to two prayer requests from, from six-year-olds or five-year-olds when the kids were little up in, you know, people in their 60s. They all share one to two prayer requests. And we've been doing it for, for 35 years together on these vacations. And I, it was last year or the year before. Um, I don't know why I get choked up. I guess because, because I get choked up, right? But because it means something to me. But, but on this, I think it was last year or the year before, Teresa's mom gave us a copy of, of all the prayer requests from the last 30 some odd years. A, a, a third of a century of requests from little ones and, and big ones in our family. And, and as, you know, as I look back at that, and I realize they take these prayer requests every year because they say, we want to pray for you. We want to pray for our family. We want to pray for our kids. We want to pray for our grandkids. And as, I, as we read back through that, it was so, co- so cool to see God's hand in our family over a third of a century. Ups and downs, joys and sorrows, good times and bad times, but always evidence that God was present. And as we look at Psalm 126, God provides us the perfect emotional map for a person that believes and is following Jesus. It's a glimpse of the life of faith, a life of ups and downs. The setting isn't particularly important for us in terms of application today, but, but plenty of scholars believe that this psalm was written in response to the people of God in, in the, in, at a time of exile, where they had been exiled to Babylon and they're coming back to the promised land. This might be correct, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't say. The essential thing here is this, is, isn't the setting. It's a voice of a people the people of God, that remember a time of deliverance, a time of incredible joy, and are presently experiencing a time of weeping and sorrow. The past were good times, but right now they're going through difficult times. And so a practical question for us today is, how do we handle our weeping, and how do we handle our sorrow? And do we understand them in terms of uh, the same light as these people that this psalm talks about, these people of God. Especially in light of verse 6, which 
Again, reads, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, seed to plant, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Do, do, we, do we use our sorrows in, in, in a good way, or do we waste our sorrows? That's the question. You see, we live in a culture that's afraid of sorrow. We're afraid of adversity, um, and we avoid it at all costs. In, in fact, oftentimes we try to hide um, in busyness or in things that will numb our senses and numb the realities of the, of the adversities and the difficulties that we face in life. And yet, it's a part of life, isn't it? There's joys and there's sorrows, and that's the message of this psalm. And, and you know, you, you just look at the entertainment industry, and it, reve- it reveals uh, just these signs of a depletion of joy in our culture. We don't understand how to embrace sorrow, and so we can't understand how to embrace joy. They go hand in hand. Eugene Peterson said that society is a bored, gluttonous king employing a jester to divert it after an overindulgent meal. Joy eludes us, and so we overindulge. Perhaps perhaps many people are trying to to numb their senses or to, to fill the emptiness because they don't understand and they don't know where true joy comes from. But could, could lasting joy come from something different than what a lot of people seek in this world or what they go towards? Could it be available to everyone who seeks and yet so often be missed by, by many? Perhaps you're here today. And you're wondering if there's more to life, if, if there's something with more substance. And, and you've tried a litany of different things in pursuit of happiness, in pursuit of joy, and, and, and you found them wanting. They're temporary. They, they, give, you joy, they give you happiness for a moment, but, it, but then it, it fades. Could it be that the absurdity of the gospel and what God offers through Jesus is what we really need and what we're really always seeking. Could it be that it's always right in front of us and yet so often people just walk right by it? Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the famous philosopher, said most men pursue pleasure with such breathless haste that they hurry past it. Most men pursue pleasure with such breathless haste that they hurry right past it. And truthfully, many people search and they seek. Many of us, and all of us do it at different times. We seek and we, we, we look for it in the wrong places or through the wrong means. Is, has that ever been your experience? It's like living in a make-believe world. You think you're in the reality, but then you realize it's just the matrix. Have you seen that movie? It's not the real world. There's one author, Walter uh, Walgreen, that says it this way. He says, the difference between shallow happiness and deep, sustaining joy is sorrow. Happiness lives where sorrow is not. When sorrow arrives, happiness dies. It can't stand pain. Joy, on the other hand, rises from sorrow and therefore can withstand all grief. Joy, by the grace of God, is the transfiguration of suffering into endurance, a reference to the cross there, and of endurance into character, and of character into hope, and of hope that has become our joy does not disappoint us, as happiness must for those who depend upon it. And so my question is, what are you doing with your tears? What are you doing with your sorrow? I would contend that, they, that your sorrow, that your tears need to be sown. They need to be planted. They need to be invested. Think about it for a moment. It, it's, it's, there's a paradoxical beauty to tears. Tears are water. Water brings life. It, it can be channeled and it can be deployed to bring about fruit, a fruitful garden. Are you investing your tears in the right place? How do do you weep, in other words? How how do you embrace your sorrow? Do you deny or repress your sorrow like like someone with no hope who fails to see God at work? You see, life will give us reasons to weep. It will give us sorrows. 
And Psalm 126 gives us instruction on how we should walk through those sorrows. I, I, I want to just give three uh, simple uh, yet profound principles on this. The first one is this, okay? The life of faith is a life <clears throat> of both rejoicing and weeping. Okay, and now that might seem obvious, and, and, uh, but, but I want to I ask you just to reflect on it for a moment. What, what does this psalm tell us about joy and sorrow? Well, first it tells us that God's people um, have experienced a tremendous act of his deliverance, okay? Like I said earlier, maybe it was the deliverance from Babylon back to the promised land. It, 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 it should make us a little bit curious about what this event is referencing because when you look at the passage here, we see that God had so powerfully delivered his people. He had so powerfully shown up in given his love and his favor towards his people that the onlookers, the other nations, it says, looked down and they were like, wow, their God is God. And yet, and yet they face trouble again in verse 4. You see, verses 1 through 3 are remembering something in the past. And then verses 4 through 6 reference their present circumstance. Verse 4 says, restore our fortunes. You see, they were remembering before, and now they're saying, God, restore our fortunes. Now, now that's the obvious lesson here. No matter how much God does for you in this life, no matter how much blessing you have and how much joy he gives you, it doesn't eliminate the presence of sorrow. No matter how much you laugh in life, you'll also weep. It's kind of saying that, that you're going to have both, maybe equally, joy and sorrow. You, you're going to have them both. Re remember my earlier statement that this is the perfect emotional map to the life of faith, the life of somebody following Jesus. You're not going to have a plethora of joy and just a little bit of sorrow in life. That's not the way it works. And, and as a Christian, God doesn't give you a special get-out-of-jail card. We face as much suffering, as much sorrow as the next person. But I, what I really love in Psalm 126 is this. The joy is, is, is I mean, it's, it's oozing and thrown into verses 1 through 3, and it's also in verses 4 through 6. It's in the good times and it's in the bad times. You see, it's all about tears and weeping and sorrow and the fact that we need our fortunes restored as the people of Israel in the passage, right? But in verse 6, it says, joy has the final word. Joy always has the final word. In other words, quantitatively, the believer's life has equal joy and equal sorrow, equal weeping and equal rejoicing. And as Christians, we face much of the same grief in life as, as, as our non-believing friends. We experience hardship. We experience rejection. We experience disease. We experience frustrations. We experience death just like the next person. But qualitatively, joy has the final word for the Christian. That's, that's the gospel. Joy has the final word. In, in fact, it's the beginning and it's the end of the Christian life. A, a peace and a joy that guards our hearts. That's what God gives us. If, if you're a new Christian, then you need to understand your future. Quantitatively, you're, you're going to face joy and sorrow. You're going to. But qualitatively, you'll receive joy that can't be extinguished. It can't be taken away. It can't be stuff, snuffed away from adversity. It, it, it's kind of like a, a pilot light on a stove. Uh, for, for the Christian, the, the burner will most likely, it, sometimes it'll be full burn, right? It's on high and it's going, it's going strong. But other times, it's not, it's not always going to be that way. Other times, it's going to be low. But the truth is, the pilot light will always be lit. There'll always be that glimmer, that, that underlying joy that's ready. If you look close, you'll see it. So when God turns the knob up and the gas comes through in greater proportion, the flame, the flame will come again. But joy, joy is always the final note. It's always there. 
But that doesn't mean that as a Christian, you'll, you'll always have immense joy, it, that it's always constant. It's, it's going to be up and down. Why is this so? Well, that's a good question. It's because we follow a Savior. Because we, we have this, this Savior in Jesus who both was a rejoicer and a weeper. He mourns and he sings. And when he decided to start his ministry, what, what was his first miracle? He intentionally made his first miracle a sign where he, that he showed up who he is and what he's about by creating a vat of, of great wine at a wedding, making a, making a celebration and an even greater celebration, saving the day um, as they ran out. Jesus made a clear statement here. At first, he doesn't raise the dead. He doesn't cast out demons. He, he doesn't heal the sick. He doesn't walk on stormy waters. Instead, in John chapter 2, what does he do? He enters a wedding party in Cana, and he turns up the energy. And, and what's this mean? It means that he's saying to us that I came to bring celebration for you as my people. I came to bring joy. Yet if you go to a Bible concordance, if you go to one of those books or go online that, that does word studies and you look at words and phrases that repeat in the Gospels, you'll, you'll see words like weep and groan and sigh and moved with pity and sadness. And you'll discover that the Gospel is leader, littered with these kinds of descriptives of Jesus, um, his, his emotions. He's the one who helps the party happen. And yet he's a man of sorrow familiar with grief. That's what the Gospels tell us. He's well acquainted with great joy and yet tremendous sorrow. That's our Savior. Hebrews 12 tells us why he chose to go through his sorrow. See, see Jesus, unlike us, we, f we face sorrows for different reasons in life, right? But Jesus chose his sorrow. He, he didn't have to come here as a man. But he did it. He chose it, and he chose it for us. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us why he chose to go through his sorrow. Because who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame. That's the joy of our, sal our salvation. The joy that was set before him. He knew what his suffering was going to bring. It was going to bring our salvation. And so he embraced it. Augustine said that God had one son on earth without sin, but he never had one without suffering. He had one son without sin, but never had one without suffering. You see, the life of faith is a mixed bag of joy and sorrow. That's part of the message here in Psalm 126. The, the second principle is this, that, and, and it's kind of obscure, and it's a, it may be a little surprising, uh, more surprising than the first, and that's this. That the, the life of faith is a life of greater joy and greater sorrow than before. That sounds like bad news, but it's actually good news. When you become a Christian, you don't just become a happier person, in other words. You become a happier person and a sadder person at the same time. That's kind of weird for me to say that, but the, the life of faith is a life of greater joy and greater sorrow. Why? Well, in this passage, they're weeping because they experienced Great blessing in the past. And, and, so, and so they tasted that the Lord was good. And so their present sorrow is, is all the more bitter because they've experienced God's presence and God's blessing in a way that they, they know what it's like. They know the other side of it. But what if, what if we approach life in a pessimistic manner? What if somebody, has, what if somebody lives as a pessimist? What, what if they think that life is meaningless and, and that they're unaware that there's a God who wants to bless us and, and he wants us to know him. In that case, that person may say, don't waste your time weeping. They, they may give up and, and want to become self-serving and, and hedonistic and, and, and just be a fatalist, but the psalmist knows the truth. So, so the experience of salvation makes their weeping greater. And if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you'll see that when you become a Christian, you not only become happier, happier, you also become sadder at pretty much the same time. And it's not a bad thing. Let, let me explain. The joy 
part is obvious. We get that. When you become a Christian, you know something you didn't know before, and you experience something you didn't experience before, that, that God is God, and that, that He's in your life, and He loves you, and, and you know that your destiny is secure in Him. When you follow Jesus, you know that He loves you, no matter what. You are His. Your name is written in the, the Lamb's Book of Life, it says. He accepts you as His child, and, and, and that's clear. But why more sorrow? Why would I say more sorrow? Why does this passage point to that? Well, for biblical context, there's an amazing phenomenon that's observed and mentioned about God's people. Case in point, Ezekiel 11, 19. Maybe you're familiar with the verse. It says, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And he says it again in Ezekiel 36, and Paul um, refers to it. He picks up on this idea in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 3, where, where he says, You are a letter of Christ written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on a tablet of stone, but on human hearts. And so you, you, you see, the, the point is that the gospel takes away your heart of stone. When you experience Jesus, when you experience the gospel, it takes away your heart of stone and it turns it into a heart of flesh. Now what does that mean? It means that salvation will not just make your heart happier. It will also simply make it more of a heart. God gives you a heart when you become a Christian is what the scriptures say. It it will make you feel more deeply. It will transform your heart from stone to flesh. It makes your heart more like the heart that God intended you to have all along. One of my all-time favorite movies is a movie called The Mission. Have you ever seen it before? There's a a lot of famous actors in it. Two of them that are uh, stage front are Jeremy Irons and, and Robert De Niro. It's an epic redemptive plot. It's an old one, but it's a goodie. Uh, great cin- cinematography, a great plot, and everything else. But, but Iron plays a, an 18th century Spanish Jesuit priest who's trying to protect a remote South, Af- South American um, tribe from the danger of falling into the hands of uh, the clutches of pro- pro-slavery uh, Portugal. And uh, De Niro, on the other hand, he's kind of the nemesis. He, he's a ruthless stone-hearted slave trader making money off the plight and the anguish of the innocent Indians that Jeremy Irons is trying to protect. So he abducts them and he sells them into slavery. That is until the the storyline, until he comes to faith in Jesus, until he meets Jesus. Once he's confronted with the gospel, he flips from being stone-hearted to having a, a heart of flesh. And, 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 and he becomes a protector of the in Indians instead of the one that takes advantage of them. And he joins along with Jeremy Irons in serving them. The Nero's character transforms from stone to flesh. Why? Because of the gospel, because he experiences Jesus. He takes on greater sorrow. And this is the idea here. Your heart changes when you experience the gospel. Before it was stony and calloused and and, and filled with defense mechanisms and and, and all sorts of tactics to keep things out that that should make and did make the only perfect heart in the history of the world weep. Why did Jesus weep? Because he was perfect and so he was more compassionate. He cared about other people. He saw other people in their plight. He was more in tune with his Father's heart for the world. And the more you lean into Jesus, the more you're going to weep for yourself and for others. That's the message. And you also weep because you know that your sin, uh, your your sin breaks your heart. When you do things that are wrong, it it disappoints you and it breaks your heart. You know that it impacts God's heart also. And, And and so you see things a little bit differently because when you become a Christian, you, you, before you became a Christian, you didn't know the joy that people could experience. You didn't know the joy that you could experience. But when you experience it now, you've experienced it firsthand and you'll never look at other people in the same way again. 
you know, you know what they can be. You know what they can experience. And so like Jesus, you weep for them. You weep for yourself. Maybe it's obvious, but before you're a Christian, oftentimes you may say, that's just the way people are when you see things in their lives. But that's a way of hardening your heart. That's a way of desensitizing yourself to and not really caring. But, but you know, now you know what God sees. And now you know what God desires and what people can be and what our world can be if we live with hearts of flesh. And so you weep. So the Christian life is a life of, of joy and tears. But it's also a life of greater joy and greater tears. And in De Niro's character in the mission, he ends up sacrificing his all for the people he once treated as possessions. He sacrifices his, his, his life because of love, because he's experienced the love of God and he wants to extend it to others. And that's what Christians do. They give their lives. They experience more sorrow as a result. But it's good sorrow. And by the way, maybe you've been taught uh, directly or indirectly uh, as men that we're not supposed to weep. And, and, and this passage is saying, no, weeping is good. And in a real sense, w women, th this means that you'll weep for new things in, in, a, in a new manner. Not just, we won't just weep in self-pity. Instead, we'll have tears of aspiration um, for others and, and, and for their pain. And that's a sign of Christian character and Christian strength. And that, that leads to the third principle. The final principle is this. That, and it's, I would say it's yet more profound. In some ways, it only takes place in, in one place in the Old Testament, and that's in Psalm 126. And that's this, that the life of faith is a life of interdependent joy and sorrow. It's a life of interdependent joy and sorrow. In other words, joy produces tears and tears produce joy. In Psalm 30, there's this famous phrase that um, maybe you've sang uh, as a song here at Faith before. I know I've sang it before. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I know my, my wife, she's got all the songs in her mind, so she's already got the song. I think it's Daryl Mansfield that sang it. But, but, but it's, it's repeated oftentimes in the Old Testament. And, and, and what it means is that sorrow gives way to joy. You, you may have sorrow, but in the end, you will have joy. We see that in the Scriptures time and time again in the Old Testament. If you believe in Him, your sorrow will give way to joy. Sorrow is temporary. Joy is permanent. But, but the New Testament gives us something even more amazing and profound than that. Because in the New Testament, it doesn't just say that for the Christian, sorrow gives way to joy. It actually says that sorrow produces joy. Sorrow produces joy for the Christian. The, the classic place that this is mentioned is in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where it says, so we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Another translation says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so sorrow produces joy, we're taught as Christians. One, one uh, Bible scholar, Derek Kidner, says that no one in philosophy and religion in the Old Testament times, before the times of Jesus, no one understood this until Jesus became flesh. That's when it becomes a reality, when it's understandable, even though it's mentioned in Psalm 126. When, when, when you look at Jesus, you see a man of incredible sorrows. He was afflicted and in pain. He was rejected. He was tortured. He was killed. He had sorrow like no other man before and no other man afterwards. But his sorrows, his sorrows didn't give way to joy. His sorrows produced joy. Eternal rejoicing, eternal joy. His sorrows redeemed and opened the doors of joy and glory for all to receive. And if this is true of Jesus, then, then there must be a manner in which this is true of us today as well. If you know and you understand these things, and if you're careful with your sorrows, then, then 
it won't just give way to joy. It will produce joy. And Kidner, that theologian, says that, it, that the only place that it's found in the Old Testament is in Psalm 126, verse 5. Because it doesn't just say there, don't worry, like it says in Psalm 130, or Psalm 30, I said, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. What does it say? It says that those who sow in tears will reap in joy. The tears are watering something, in other words. You see, the tears are not just giving way to joy, they're producing joy. And how does that work? Well, notice that it doesn't just say that it might happen or it'll happen occasionally. It says that it will happen. The psalmist allows variations on how it happens, how how sorrow produces joy, but it says that it will work out this way. God will work it out this way. He knows that it will happen. Now, it, and it says in verse 4, it says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of the Negev. That's one of the prayers of the psalmist here. And, and, and what are the streams of the Negev? What, what do they represent? Well, the Negev is a, is a desolate desert in the land of Israel. And uh, if you were to go and visit it, you, you'd see there's all sorts of these dried riverbeds everywhere. And, and um, if you visited it, you'd probably look at it and you'd say, there's, this is a terrible place. It's parched, it's dry, it's a wasteland, it's lifeless. And you, you may assume that the, the riverbeds that you see there when you go, that they're, they're, they're signs from a distant past, but they're not. They're not. You see, what happens in that land is, on occasion, there'll be, there'll be great storms that hit the mountains. And when they hit the mountains, what does mountain water do? It flows down. And it flows that down into the desert. And the riverbeds fill. And the land of Negev all of a sudden becomes a plush land, a fruitful land again. That's what happens. And so the psalmist is asking, God, would you work in this way for us? Would you please, would you do a miracle for us? Bring the, bring the floods again so that, so that joy will come in again. Please take away our troubles, God. That's their prayer. Have you ever prayed that way before? I certainly have. Come down in a great way like you did before, God. But, but then in verse 5 and 6, we see the psalmist say, but God, this is what we know. This is what we know. That if you keep us in times of weeping, there will still be times of joy to come. Joy will come. And it may be a flash flood in the desert, or it may be us painstakingly allowing our tears to flow, our tears to be planted, and bring joy again and bring a harvest. And so the question is, how is it possible that joy and sorrow can be so inter interdependent? Gospel joy produces gospel sorrow, and gospel sorrow produces gospel joy. Well, here are a few examples of how it plays out for us as Christians. Uh, first of all, the, gospel joy means that, that you will be repentant more often. When, when you become a Christian, you, you repent more. You ask for forgiveness more. Because before you became a Christian... You believe that the reason that your friends and your family and, and God would love you, why they would like you, was because you were a good person, because you were likable, because you were lovable. And, and, and this, that mindset that we have pre-Jesus creates an intellectual limit to our being able to admit our own flaws, to, re, to admit that we're angry, to admit that we're, that we're cowardly at times. And admitting it would be psychological suicide. It's the same for all of us before we meet Jesus. And so we don't have a framework for this kind of repentance. So, so you feel like you'd rather throw yourself off a bridge than admit it. But then when you become a Christian, when you become a Christian and you come to understand the gospel, that he came to live the life that, that you should live, that you were meant to live, and that he died the death that you should die. He died it for you and for me. And that he was our substitute and he's our mediator, that he's our savior. When you believe in him, when you believe in him, then it changes the way you think. It changes the way you face reality, what you understand about yourself, what you understand about him. 
you know that you are completely loved by him. And so you can admit your flaws more freely. And you know his love for you is not tied to you being a good person or a bad person. He, just, he loves you because he's your God. He doesn't love you because of your, your goodness. He loves you because he's your father. And your self-worth isn't at risk then. And so joy, gospel joy enables you to repent in ways that you couldn't repent before. If you understand the gospel, then you'll be repenting much more quickly and much more deeply. And it, it won't be bitter or horrible. Before repentance was like, was like failing to breathe. But with the gospel, repentance is like, is like learning to breathe more deeply, to breathe life in. Before repentance was like jumping out of that tree in the Smoky Mountains without being hooked to the line. You just plunge and splat on the, the forest floor. But now when you've experienced Jesus, it's like, it's like flying in that zip line from tree to tree to, to new places of freedom, new places of life. If you experience his joy, you will want to repent all the time. And so, so when you, you're in a conflict with someone, you're, you're going to be inclined to ask, am, am I being self-centered in this situation? Is, is there something that I've done here to cause this problem? And, and you're not going to do it in a woe is me or self-pity way. It's going to be genuine humility and a desire to be clean and to be free and to be right with others. And instead of blaming others, you'll first look in the mirror and ask God, God, what, what do I need to learn here? That's what happens when you become a Christian. And so we repent more. And, and every time you repent, you're freed. Christianity frees you from slavery. It frees us from, from the idols. And, and the gospel brings freedom to live life to the full. That's what Jesus does for us. He frees you from the things that weigh you down and the things that others worship and the others seek and they idolize, the things that, that they think and that maybe we have thought and we bought into the lie that we think brings life, but often it strips life away if you trust in those things. You see, the message of the gospel is that before you really rest in Christ, before you trust him as your savior, you look to other things to save you. You look to relationships and status and, and control and other people and circumstances and money and things and accomplishments and approval and, and power and more thrills. But when you accept Jesus, when you accept Jesus, you become free from these things enslaving you. His approval frees you from needing the approval of others. And, and, and his wealth frees you from needing things for joy. And so when, you, when we have the things in life, the good things of life, material things and relationships and health and all those things, we don't look to them as our gods. We look to them as gifts from God. There's a difference. And, and, and another reason why we weep more is because we realize that we value Jesus' love so little. And I mean, there are times where I just I dis I disappoint myself, even as a Christian, and, I, and it just makes me weep more that I'm I'm not leaning to Jesus' love as much as I should. In other words, Jesus' love is not as much of a consolation to me as it should be. And, and when you start to repent for loving Jesus too little, what happens is that that a, a new level of love comes in, and a new level of peace, a new level of joy comes in at a deeper level and with, with greater freedom. And the more dependent you are on him, the more independent you become of everything else, of people, of circumstances, of things, of all that the world has to offer, and of what people think of you and what they say of you. And, 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 and another reason that we have greater sorrow and, and it, it becomes interdependent is if you have the gospel, if you've experienced Jesus, th then you're going to have a tremendous assurance of God's love. And so you're going to stick out your neck and talk to people about these things. People that don't always want to hear the good news. They don't always want to hear about Jesus. And, and so it's going to cause you some of the time to enter into the messiness of other people's lives because you've experienced the transformation and the joy of God. And it's going to create greater sorrow as you look at the world and you see people around. And it's going to, that's going to cause you to enter in because you know the joy that they can experience. And, and you know, we, we can look at this gospel of joy produces gospel of sorrow, causing you to be involved in their lives. And, and you can look at the, you can look at the, the Apostle Paul. 
And over and over again, he says that he admonishes us with his tears. He, and, 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 and what are these tears? Well, he, he says, I warn you with tears, and I speak to you with tears. Over and over again, the Apostle Paul in the epistles in the New Testament talks about tears. He's always talking about tears. And why is Paul always crying? What, what's going on? You know why? Because it's difficult to tell others the things that they, they need to hear, but they don't want to hear. And it's difficult to enter into the messiness of other people's lives. But why do you do it? You do it because you're no longer a slave to what people think. And your heart's no longer a heart of stone. You care. And so you enter in and you empathize and, and, you, and you love. And, and it's extremely hard to have, to, to, to not do it when you've experienced God. Because you're no longer a slave to those things. And so you enter in. The joy of the gospel produces an engagement with other people and with life, a love that's, that, that loves other people tangibly and produces all sorts of tears. But, but, the, but these tears will bring incredible joy. And there's nothing more amazing than, than you're sharing the good news with another person and loving another person and helping them and seeing it breathe life into them. There's nothing greater in life than helping another person. And that's the Christian life. After we become a Christian, and, and, you, and you, look, you look at Jesus on the cross, you realize that when he was on the cross, he asked his father, why? Why me? Why have you forsaken me? He asked the father. But when you ask God why, why, why did I get laid off? Why do I face suffering? Why, why do I face disease? Why, why is my mom ill? You ask, and, and you might not get clear answers right away. We don't always have the answers this side of life. But when Jesus called out to heaven, why have you forsaken me? We know the answer. We know the answer. Why did Jesus have sorrow? Why did Jesus suffer? He suffered for me. He suffered for you. He suffered for us. He intentionally did it for us. He suffered an unjust death to redeem us. And when we understand the answer to Jesus, why me? We never ask why me again in the same way. Because we say, I have no idea why I'm going through this suffering. Why, why these bad things are happening in my life right now. But if, if the God who runs the universe is willing to die for me, if he's willing to give his son's life for me, if Jesus willingly sacrificed his life on the cross for me, then I know that there's some way in which tears and suffering are going to produce joy. I know in some way God's going to turn this around. He's going to bring this. He's going to bring a joy, an unspeakable joy like I've never experienced before. And this psalm makes us pray, Lord, teach me to weep like you've wept so I can rejoice like you've rejoiced. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that that you offer us this unspeakable joy in Jesus, that you offer us new life in Jesus. And Father, as I prayed at the beginning, the beginning of this, this morning, there are some of us here, Father, that, that have experienced that joy. We, we've experienced that life in Jesus. And there's other ones that are still trying to, to figure it out. Wherever we're at today, Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand more of this joy and this sorrow that's... That, brings complete joy for us in Christ. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.